Hello Africa, my name is Senor Hussi and I'm an under 40 CEO. The African Renaissance. The concept that the African people and nation shall overcome the current challenges confronting the continent and achieve cultural, scientific, and economic renewal is here and with young men and women taking the lead. Some call them the new school heroes. We call them under 40 CEOs. Senor Hosi is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. Prior to joining the CBOD, he worked as the Group General Manager for Meridian Management and Investments and served as a director at Eco Petroleum Limited. He is a trade finance expert and management consultant with working and management experience across varying industries, including FMCG, commodity trading, finance, logistics, and downstream petroleum. He holds an MBA in finance from the University of Ghana. All right, welcome to Under 40 CEO, Senor. It's a pleasure for me. You attended University of Ghana, where you bagged your master's degree in business well. administration. Now, what's interesting is that you got a CGPA of um, 3.78. Now, would you say it was all about the books at that time? Oh, wow. The research is pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> I was working then, and I had quite an um, official role in Nigeria back then. So I was combining work a few times flying out. It was one of the first times in my life I decided to learn to know and to learn to pass. And, mm. and the grace just came in. Now, as CEO of the Ghana Chamber of uh, Bulk Oil Distributors, you operate as a lobbyist, representative, advocate, strategist, and even analyst. Please do tell me more about your activities as Seaboard. As a chamber, um, we represent our members. Um, we are lobbyists. I mean, I'm a lobbyist. I don't shy from that at all. Mm -hmm. um, we have a role to try and pursue that which is in the interest of our members, but also that which is uh, in line with that which is good for the country. Mm -hmm. Our role is one of service. Our role is one that's supposed to help improve the lives of, of the players within the industry. And that also um, implies the consumer. Mm -hmm. And the consumer is a citizenry of Ghana. Definitely. So our, our role actually extends to that. We represent the BDCs. We advocate in that um, we try to shape policies. We set agenda sometimes, okay. um, dependent on what, what it is. We also gather public um, to also review uh, particular policies that may be adopted by government and that, in our opinion, is inimical to both industry and country. Mm. And we have a role that's also strategic. How can we get industry more viable than it is? So okay. we need to look at things from the industry level and it's quite, it's, quite, it's quite a lot. Now being an African, one would have expected the CEO of your organization to be a much older individual. How did you pull this off? Oh, quite interesting. Very <laughs> humble beginnings. Um, yeah. I used to be an acting MD for a bulk distribution company, uh, mm -hmm. quite, quite a younger, much younger age, because I had, I had the energy and I actually had the passion for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I had um, bosses then who believed in my abilities, and I'd proven that on other businesses. Mm -hmm. I was a group general manager for their group, and this also came in. It's a business I, I would have had developing with them. And they gave me every support. And I acted as MD at a point. And um, it was strategic enough to get other partners in. Wow. And I actually moved to becoming just a board member. Okay. And um, moved on um, to, to this job. And it occurred to me that if industry was not going to cooperate at a unit level, you're going to have problems because there were major issues facing the industry at the time. Mm -hmm. So somebody had to really get a chamber like this going on. I mooted the idea in an industry that a lot of people mis I mean, there was a lot of mistrust. People hardly, the competition was too keen. Mm -hmm. it, it was a bit negative. So it, it were very few people could be found that everyone could rally around. And I was one of those and they gave me the nod then just on a temporary basis and it was something okay. I was quite passionate about okay. and I prefer to look at things from an industry level than a, than a cooperation level mm. so I try to get this going mm. and one step at a time the chamber has grown pretty well and we've tried to help stabilize the industry significantly um, a number of the challenges seem to be fizzling out and everybody's come to appreciate the relevance and value of the chamber over time. There are certain headlines you know 
that you made with some of your quotes, some things you said. Petroleum taxes responsible for fuel price hikes are not BDC's fault. Um, read one headline quoting you. Now, you also recently had to announce to all of Ghana that a petrol shortage was imminent. Now, that's a really tough job, isn't it? There are, there are very big calls, but yeah, somebody has to make that call. Um, one, probably to get the right attention to deal with the issues. At some level, you are privy to quite some information. So you have more of a, a global look at things. If X is going to happen as at this time, I can see its rippling effect within the economy. You know, I'm also an economic policy analyst, so I can see its implications. I'm a finance man too, mm -hmm. so I can also see what's happening. Mm -hmm. And as an industry player and a businessman too, I see its implications. So everybody has some responsibility to help us all come together to get things resolved. So I have to make the right calls. You said, and I would like to quote you, that Ghana is prepared to lead petroleum upstream sector. How did you come to this conclusion? I can't debate the fact Nigeria is most place to really be the right example for upstream. And um, I believe over time it will set more and more of its place. I'm quite positive about Nigeria, what it can mm -hmm. be. But Ghana, I think, may be a better place for, for refinery mm -hmm. uh, work, for downstream work, for trading and all that. One, we have the political stability going for us. That is very predictable. We are easily in the center of the world. We are mm. close to being in the center of West Africa itself. So that is a major advantage. Mm. Policy has to be shaped right to leverage that and turn here into another Ara region. There's no reason why here can't be Rotterdam. There's mm. no reason why here can't be Antwerp, mm. where a lot more refinery is being, uh, refining is being done. Mm. All redistribution is done to more of the Sahelian um, countries. There's so much crude produced in West Africa. For goodness sake, I think it's quite irresponsible on all of us as a people to have so much crude produce here and mm. all of us keep importing products mm. from Europe. Mm. Now we're importing products from America. Mm. That should tell you how effectively we're actually managing our resources and trying to generate the right multiplying effect to turn around our economies. Petroleum has that capacity to turn things around for all of us. And I think Ghana is well placed for that, but um, I believe over time we will be able to take advantage of these opportunities before they pass us by. Okay, so are you saying that if Ghana and possibly Nigeria got their act right in the area of refining products um, for local consumption, it will tell and reflect hugely on the end cost of the customers? And end customers on the economy and everything. There's a multiplier effect that it has. Crude is produced here. There's a lot more technology transfer. You have a lot more Ghanaian and Nigerians moving into the trade. We speak English. It is actually the language of trade within the industry. Those surrounding us are mainly Francophone, OK? Can we turn that around? Can we cut out the need to actually set up landing offices? It has the financial sector to actually trigger if we really want to drive this because of the volumes that are consumed in West Africa alone. That's a huge market. If you want to spread the risk, a lot more investment is done in production, in crude, in Nigeria. There's production going on here. More service skills are coming out of Nigeria. If you want to have redistribution in a part of the refinery centralized somewhere in Ghana because of the distance you have, okay, it's easier to redistribute here. And probably the language bit, um, the political, relative, uh, relatively political, um, politically stable environment we have, Everything changes one morning. Mm. A lot more, I mean, Nigerians and Ghanaians become real world-class traders. A lot of the banks here would now become major banks, will become some, some yardstick for finance engineering. You know, a lot more employment, okay? A lot more services that feed these um, industries. And uh, progressively, we should have the best effect of, of, of this resource that God has blessed both countries with. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't think we are making the most of it. This is Under 40 CEOs. Senior is a busy man whose activities or inactivity affects millions of lives, so he definitely works long hours. Many say that becoming a successful CEO means that something must give. Is work-life balance really a myth or can it be achieved? 
I'd like to talk about work-life balance. I know you're married to Gloria. I know you have a daughter. And I have a son. And, and a, a son, son as well. Place, yeah. Beautiful. So how do you manage to balance work and family? Is it even possible to achieve a balance? Or is it a myth? It is very possible, but um, I wouldn't say I've been that um, successful. Mm. Uh, my boy, for instance, I spent a lot of time myself trying to bring him up. I used to... Uh, bathing myself, dress him up, oh, nice. prepare his breakfast, prepare his lunch then at the, at the school that he used to carry lunch to. So I used to do that, even though I had a very busy schedule. But things have gotten a bit rougher. The last um, three years have been much tougher. I'm already mm -hmm. an early riser. Uh, I close much later. But to make it up, I have to make myself a bit more available during um, the weekends. Mm. Uh, my son's graduation at one stage or another, I missed because at the time we were facing a major uh, full crisis, shortage crisis. Mm. And to turn around, I needed to put my boots on and be on the field very early so I couldn't turn up. But I tried to make it up in other ways. Uh, at least last year, I tried to join them for vacation. Mm. And um, I think it was fairly okay. okay. But it's possible and it's appropriate to, to get a balance. Um, I've woken up to that reality a lot more. Family is everything. I don't think to be worth having all the success and publicly being acknowledged that much and things going and home is not well balanced because mm. Papa wasn't there. Mm. It would be a big shame. So I've, I've taken a conscious decision okay. to equally make it important like, awesome. or even more important than um, I, I take work. Now talking about vacation, I'm sure you're very well traveled. Now how is travel? and interacting with different cultures helps to shape your person. It just makes me realize you are not alone with your status. Mm. Um, all you have is not just where you are. Mm. And um, in all you think, you, you, you need to think globally. Um, I tell people, whilst you educate your kids, while you work, you should realize you're in competition actually with the world. Um, people are seeing your markets. You should also realize other markets also very well exist and uh, people are out there to be very competitive. Mm -hmm. You are competing with the world. Mm -hmm. Every market share that's run in your country can actually be taken by somebody's export which becomes your import. So you always need to remember that every industry anywhere you are is competing with the world. With your management skills, you need to be a bit more flexible and open-minded about broad world views. Various things work in various places differently. If Africa has to get to the next stage, African entrepreneurs need to start thinking globally. There's no reason why Ghanaian companies should not be running their show in places like Asia. You know, like the way you are having British and American banks Thanks. finding their way here. It should always awaken the opportunities that we have as a people. We are great people. The mm. only problem I think we have as Africa is that we don't realize it and we don't really even want to be the uh, exercise the greatness that we have. We need to wake up. We are sleeping giant. Now, in 2013, you dropped this quote by Brian Tracy on social media. You said, losers make excuses, winners make progress. Have you ever been one to make excuses? That's what I don't encourage here. Everybody here will tell you. No, I don't. Um, I, don't I don't actually encourage you telling me and telling you, look, I sent him a mail. Your job here is to get a job done. Your job is not to explain why the job is not done. Your job here is not to show you did your part. That is reckless, is not acceptable. None of that moves us forward. If you need to get me to get your job done, and you think you sent me a mail, don't come and tell me when I ask you that I sent you mail. Forget it. You'll be fired that next day. All right? You should come and be handing me till I give you the attention. Mm. If you need me to sign off on a memo, and I'm not making it because I've become so busy, you are more equally important. And as far as your job is concerned, it's more important than any other thing I find busy. Mm. You should be sitting in my office and telling me you either sign off or you, you don't get out of here. <laughs> and I, yes, and I call that boss management. Mm. People must learn to manage their bosses. Um, we get too respectful, you know, when it has to do with bosses. Bosses appreciate, in my opinion, results mm -hmm. much more than, in my opinion, respect. You once also said, you know, that tools should be manned by disabled people. Now, I want to assume that I understand what you meant, but what, in your opinion, were you trying to, to get across? <laughs> Well, I'm hoping that my favorite code doesn't come now. <laughs> Research is too deep. I think that when you are abled 
you should do things that disabled people just can't do. Mm. You know, sitting down all day, I don't think it's a productive use of somebody who has four legs, two legs, and then, I mean, four limbs, you know, two hands and, and then two, two legs. We have challenges with the disabled. They must contribute to GDP. How do you also help them get their contribution across GDP? Some jobs that can be preserved for them should be encouraged so they can do their bit in contributing to GDP. Mm. Every other person who has what they don't have, who is not as limited as they are, should be able to be out there doing other things that those guys don't do. And then we get more productivity within our economy. Mm. We have a situation where a lot of um, disabled people are found begging and all that. And it's true, if I should sit in my office, I'll have challenges trying to hire some type of disability um, disabled people doing some kinds of jobs because you may need them moving around too often. Mm -hmm. That has me they don't have the brain power. So some of these things are things they can do. Other jobs that are in offices that need a lot more brain power and less movement should be really reserved for those who are competent and possibly disabled. Look at things at that broad level. Mm -hmm. These guys have limitations. Let's mm -hmm. get them to do things that are more viable for them. Everybody, let's move them there so we can attain full employment. Full employment maximizes a country's productive uh, potential. Yeah. So you must always think of how to get people active and employed. Mm -hmm. And that should be reserved for them, man. Beautiful. Now, in 2015, you were named uh, one of Ghana's 20 under 40 influential business leaders. Now, what do these recognitions, accolades, possibly awards mean to you? I do appreciate that award, and I, it's good to know, but it means nothing to me. Mm. Delivering my results every day, trying to turn things around, getting an industry more viable is what matters more to me than any form of um, award. What changes my world is what I do today and tomorrow. All right, what I did yesterday has brought me this far. What I would need is what I do today and what I do tomorrow to get me that far. And that's more important to me. Okay, so how many people are currently in your employ? And um, what would you say is your leadership style? I'm very easygoing, very interested, but I'm quite a, a strong tax master. Mm. I am a value-oriented leader. Where is the value in what we are doing mm. at the end of the day? Mm. But I'm very jovial in this mm. office. Mm. So everybody gets a bit cautious. Mm -hmm. You are laughing together, but while you are laughing, in the middle of it, it could just spark to another, another thing because <laughs> yeah, there's a very thin line for me between us living as family at work and mm -hmm. us making sure we work as work. Mm -hmm. All right, so you need to be careful. You don't joke with the lines. You don't get carried away by any of them because mm -hmm. you need to account for the time that you're spending here delivering the value. Employment size, uh, the chamber, we keep a lean chamber. Um, the chamber is currently a team of 10 uh, running an industry that has to do, that's worth $4 billion. Wow. Um, but there's a broader team there, there are brother members there with, with a huge staff out there mm. at about a, a thousand. Mm. But um, you don't just look at a team here, you're actually mm. looking at employment across industry. Okay. I mean, what I do here could actually keep jobs for that thousand people, help create more jobs. What I do here could cause um, those jobs to be lost. Mm. So you're conscious of that. You're conscious of the fact that you must keep this industry viable at every point in time. And its value is beyond just your team of 10 that you currently keep um, in your office. We all know that human resources is a key element to consider uh, when building any enterprise. How do you hire? There's amount of sensitivity associated with our work. So I prefer referrals. I need to be a bit certain about a few things, okay, because mm. we deal with sensitive data, mm. sensitive information. Mm. We do quite some extensive research into the background of everyone we, we hire. Then probably I do the final phase of interviewing and, and taking, making the call after a number of the referrals are actually pruned down to uh, two or three. Okay. I need to have that right kick and I need to be confident that you can align with values that we, we, we work with here. So you just mentioned um, values. What values are important to you and your firm? Integrity, respect, openness, honesty, hard work. I love to see passion. We mm. value passion a lot here. Mm. Waking up every day passionate about changing the face of industry, improving industry, mm. and 
improving lives because that's what we are about. Industry impacts lives. This is petroleum, the one selling pap in the morning. Mm. Her job is heavily dependent on her ability mm. to deliver value to the country. Mm. She needs a car to carry her stuff there. If we fail, we fail her. We fail her livelihood. If we fail, we fail the, the transporter. If we fail, we fail that person who just falling ill and needs emergency attention. Mm. If we fail, we fail our country. Mm. So I need people who are passionate about that and who value passion. Mm. And it's part of what we measure. Okay. Our values has a, big, a major place in, uh, in our appraisal systems. I know that most successful business leaders have actually failed at some point. Tell me about your failures as a leader. Yeah, I've had my own share and I'm very quick to accept them. Uh, probably I'll say it started in the early days, trying to get industry to avoid the problems that we have today. I advocated for it. I tried to get people to realize it. But my inability to actually get them to change ways, I think despite highlighting them, I think probably defeated the delivery of the value. I think that I failed to lead my group well enough to appreciate the urgency and the importance of responding to the strategic issues that I raised probably some three years ago that are very, that seem to be maturing today. Mm -hmm. um, today, industry is facing a very rough time. Mm -hmm. Something that we believe will turn around and we are beginning to see some fruits of our hard work. My team has been excellent in trying to turn things around. And, mm -hmm. But that's not what I wish we, we did. I think we should, would have been better off spending our time strategizing and seeing how we can get industry beyond the borders of Ghana. Okay, but would you say that this is the biggest letdown you've had in your career? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. It is. Because its implications were enormous. It's mm -hmm. taking a lot more work to try and probably hold back its effect um, and to hopefully turn it around. But the risk is too much. All right. It's a whole industry that has been at stake for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. That's not what I think I'm supposed to have delivered. And I hope that I can turn that around and probably not call that um, a feeling anymore. anymore. This is Under 40 CEOs. Senior values integrity and respect. He is a skilled advocate and lobbyist and is extremely successful at what he does. We know what drives him, but what does Senior drive? And what does he do with the little downtime that he has? How does he enjoy the resources he works so hard to earn? I seek to find out. All right, so I have a few quick fire questions for you. What do you love to eat? Choosing is quite a difficult thing, so food is a problem, being decisive. Okay, so how would you describe your, your style? I love blazers. So what other CEOs do you currently look up to? Mm. Jack Welsh. What's your favorite car to drive? I think probably I'm very tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite travel destination? I was in Hawaii last year, and it was great for my seventh anniversary. So tell me, what book is your favorite? Dale Carnegie. How to influence people and make friends, or? How to make friends and influence, influence people. people. So what book are you reading right now? I'm reading Sax and Lorraine, and... Um... <laughs> what makes you happy? Improving lives. Mm -hmm. The fact that I realized I made a positive change. I contributed to making that positive change. It makes me happy. My kid's smile gives me some reason to live every day, but mm -hmm. what makes me happy every day is the fact that I made a difference. All right, thank you for coming on Under 40 CEO, Senor. Hope to see you in Ghana again. I will definitely be back. Hello, Africa. I am Senor Hussi, and you can be an Under 40 CEO too.